My name is Pauline Rockman, and as co-president of the Jewish Holocaust Centre, it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening to what's got the promise of a really interesting special event in conversation with Moshe Lang. May I firstly ask that you check, please, that you've turned off your phones. I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Clinical psychologist Moshe Lang is one of Australia's best-known family therapists. Born in Israel, he came to Australia in 1961. He studied psychology at the University of Melbourne. Between 1965 and 1979, he was senior psychologist at the Bouverie Clinic and director of training. In 1979, he founded William Roots Road Family Therapy Centre the first independent family therapy centre in Australia. He was foundation president of the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Family Therapy and from 1882 to 19... 1882. <laughs> Sorry, Moshe. <laughs> really, really silly. I don't feel like that very often. <laughs> I know that, I know that. And from 1982 to 1984, was president of the Victorian Association of Family Therapists, now known as Australian Association of Family Therapy. He has practiced and taught clinical psychology and family therapy in Melbourne since 1965. He has been a regular commentator on issues associated with clinical psychology and family therapy. And he's well known for his workshops and unique teaching style marked by clarity, humour and empathy. He's published extensively in the professional literature on themes ranging from work with children and adolescents, depression, eating disorders, suicide, school refusal and work with Holocaust survivors and their families, couple therapy and teaching, as well as teaching family therapy. He's brought out two highly praised DVDs, Behind Closed Doors, providing viewers, professional and general public alike with the opportunity to see him at work. As for me, I've been passionately involved in the area of Holocaust for over 20 years. The USC Shoah Foundation Institute interviewed just under 2,500 Australian survivors in between 1996 and 2000, over 1,500 in Melbourne. During that period, in my role as the regional coordinator for the foundation, I approached, approached Moshe Lang to be part of a counselling service for the Holocaust survivors we were interviewing. He readily agreed. Fast forward to 2017, Moshe approached me to interview him for the Jewish Holocaust Centre. The interviews took place over a period of few months that summer. Robbie Simons, the audiovisual producer here at the Jewish Holocaust Centre, recorded and edited and put these interviews together. The interviews were very powerful. The process was great learning. And what came through was Moshe's work over the years, particularly with Holocaust survivors and their families, the second generation. But it was also Moshe Lang growing up in Israel during and after the Shoah. In all my years of involvement in the area of Holocaust, I've never been, um, ceased to be amazed at the diversity of the experience that's contained within. There's always another angle. So you will also hear from Moshe his way, I believe, of trying to make some sense of the Shoah through his experience growing up in Israel. <laughs> and we are gathered here this evening as part of the outcome of these interviews. Moshe will be speaking with Dr. George Halash, Dr. Halash is no stranger here to the centre, consultant, and, and also he's a consultant, child and adolescent psychiatrist in private practice. He's currently an adjunct senior lecturer at the School of Psychology and Psychiatry in the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Science at Monash University. He served for some 13 years as a member of the editorial board of the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Psychiatry and has been a member of the editorial committee of the Australian Psychiatry Journal since 2005. He's published extensively in several areas, among which is Holocaust trauma and intergenerational trauma transition. He is a second generation Holocaust survivor and his lovely mother, Alice, is sitting here in the front row. 
Over the last 20 years, Dr. Halash has lectured on trauma-related events in the UK, Israel, Poland, Hong Kong, the United States, New Zealand, and Australia. I have much pleasure in inviting George, Dr. George Halash and Moshe Lang to come up and we'll start the conversation. Thank you. And I mentioned to Moshe that there are a couple of competing events, the uh, Jewish Film Festival, there's a major wedding going on at Mizrahi, uh, uh, an overseas speaker, and in Moshe's style, he said, and they didn't consult us. <laughs> so it's called, so, it's called chutzpah. chutzpah. <laughs> so it's a real delight. Uh, and I received a, a, an email from Moshe in August asking if I would be keen or willing to engage in a conversation with him. And what do you say when Moshe invites you for a conversation? You take the opportunity. And we've now met maybe two or three times at a, a beautiful cafe on the corner of Balaclava Road and Hawthorne Road, sipping lemongrass ginger tea. And we've had conversations. And I thought, in preparation for tonight, I thought, how am I going to introduce a conversation with Moshe? And he said, and gave me permission to quote, a, a student and colleague, Brian Staghole, who apparently once introduced Moshe, saying, Moshe can't wait to hear what he has to say. <laughs> now, that's a teasing sort of introduction, and I've thought about that. And you know, there's a profound truth in there. And when I sat with Moshe over the lemongrass ginger teas, it's not that he can't wait and you can't wait to hear what you have to say. It's you're tracking your own sayings while you're in conversation with me. And therefore, the experience of a conversation is like no other. You are in the presence of someone, and I've been therefore privileged to be in your presence, to feel the emergence, the discovery, the experiencing new experiences through the conversation. And so while it might be a flippant comment that Moshe would love to hear what he has to say, but I would love to hear what Moshe has to say. And I invite you to be wondering with open mind and open heart also to wonder what Moshe has to say. Now, as Pauline mentioned, she was involved with Moshe last year in a number of interviews, 14 <coughs> segments that Robbie edited and uh, has got available. And tonight is also a unique exploratory experience in that it's the launch of those videos, which as you came in, you signed forms for, be for being updated as they'll be rolled out over the coming weeks and months. And what we decided is to take six of those segments and to highlight a few minutes, the longest is the first one, about six or seven minutes, and then six other, five other segments, to, like in a book launch, you have a peek into a chapter, and you get a sense of the words. Of course, here, with video, we get a sense of Moshe actually thinking, relating, conversing, and are waiting to hear what he has to say. This is a gift, I would say, a rare and ex exceptional experience. So while you will be hearing Moshe's interview, we will stop after each one, and I will invite Moshe on tonight's state of mind, what he feels is the point of that particular video. Then I'll invite you from the audience to clarify very briefly one or maybe two points that you're really keen to be clarified. We'll do this six cycles. So video, Moshe, two points from you. Next video, Moshe, two points from you. And at the end, we will have question and answer to engage with Moshe. 
if at the end of all that there are more questions, we will have cards that you can fill out and those we will look at possibly answering after tonight on video and we're exploring a follow-up possibility as well. So with that, I'd like to perhaps open up uh, with a question, Moshe, as Pauline mentioned, you've really been an agent of change in Australian and international mental health through what is labelled family therapy. And in the 1960s, that barely existed. It was just starting to flourish, perhaps hard for the younger generation to appreciate there was a time before family therapy existed. Now it is so integral to the way of thinking about suffering and families. And as an agent of change, you not only changed the landscape, you actually changed the frame of health thinking. So it wasn't a reframe, you changed the very frame. What I'd like to perhaps open up before the videos is over that span of 50 years, what do you feel looking over the 50 years has been the highlight that's more or less remained the same and or which has radically changed and you've been integral in that change? I don't know how to answer it. <laughs> uh, uh, let me... I'll, I'll think it through. I think what I want to say in relation to this is that the experience, my experience of working with Holocaust survivors and their families has profoundly supported the major idea of family therapy, which is this, that you cannot understand symptomatology, uh, psychiatric condition, psychological pain, without putting it into the appropriate context. Family therapy is not a technique for me. It's not about the number of people in the room. It's a way of thinking. And it's a way of thinking of how you understand human beings. And from my point of view, you cannot understand them without understanding the social context. <laughs> Further, you could also say that the context is not given. You need to explore what is the appropriate context for understanding this specific, this specific individual or family. So to follow on from that, the context is not given. I mean, that I think requires a little bit of explanation, especially as we lead into introducing the Holocaust into conversation, which will be the first clip. Is that an example where in the beginning of your career, the context was not given, that is, the experiences of the Holocaust, and your radical, at that stage, radical idea was to introduce it in conversation to make a context, is that? Yeah, but you know, we are always terribly clever after the event. Um, the well, you, were, you were clever before the event, so... <laughs> My mother always thought so. <laughs> um, um, we have something in common. <laughs> Please. <laughs> I'm sure with many other people. <laughs> um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> that the context that you introduced at yeah. that stage was not a given. In fact, it's a taboo. Yeah, I didn't introduce it. No. The, the, it. It crept on me. You see, what happened growing up in Israel the Holocaust was always part of my life. Like the fish are the last to discover water, so did I discover the Holocaust. It was just, it was all, 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 all around me. And I'll give an example. In the advertisement, it says that I've worked with Holocaust survivors and their families for 50 years. And I was thinking, is it overstating it or understating it? And I remember then that at the end of first year university, there was an advertisement for a job. 
jobs looking for a psychologist, a psychologist student who teaches, who can speak, who speaks Hebrew. I thought somebody up there loves me. There was nobody else who fitted the criteria. And I rang the family and they told me the following story. The Dale uh, father, grandfather, uh, who was a Viennese Jew who came to Australia, was a, a wonderful scholar and a gentleman. And now in his late 80s, he decided that he wants to study Hebrew. But there was another issue. The other issue was that when they did not look, he would run out of the house and accost young women and made indecent suggestions to them. So they asked me to come and teach him Hebrew. And under this pretext, I would uh, stop him from going out and embarrassing everybody. And I spent the whole summer talking to him about Stefan Zweig and Mahler and Alma, about Viennese culture. When I was thinking about it, b both he and me knew one thing. We knew why he left Vienna. We knew why he does not intend to go back to Vienna. Why he wants to learn Hebrew and go to Israel before he dies. In other words, the Holocaust was there we both knew it, but we never talked about it. So it didn't, it, it came as part of, of my growth in conversation. It came out of, out of, uh, out of thin air in a way. And, but uh, I became much more clearly conscious and aware that the Holocaust is central to my way of thinking and working. Um, I forgot what year it was, probably in the 80s, when, I won't go into the details, we organized the first, probably the first conference of working with Holocaust survivors and their families. And in preparation for that presentation, it's for the first time that I actually delineated and uh, explained even to myself how important and how central it's been for me. So it's not as if I made a discovery one day, but it was a very gradual process. In the same way, I think Pauline asked me, and I said, I don't remember when I first discovered that I'm a boy. I think probably I've always known or something. It, there are things that you know and you become old, but it still takes me time until today to work out what it means to be a boy, a boy or a man, you know? And I haven't found it out. Now it gets more complicated, but let's leave that for another okay. time. Uh, perhaps this would be a good point to see the first excerpt, which is how you clinically bring in the conversation of Holocaust as relevant to a young woman who has got a shower, fear of showers called uh, shower phobia and depression, and that you, in this incremental, delicate, sensitive way, as you discover through your conversations, so you allow her to discover through her conversations with you. I want to share at this point just one of the stories that I, I wrote about, because it illustrates something very powerfully. Whilst at the Bouvery Clinic, uh, I saw this child, this girl, who suffered from what was referred to as shower phobia. In other words, she was petrified and she refused to go into the shower. Uh, and before she was referred to me with her family, People didn't understand and make sense of what was happening here. And to me, as soon as I met with the family and I realized that parents are Holocaust survivors, immediately um, I guessed what was really going on and one or two questions of the parents revealed what I suspected namely that they talked regularly about um, 
what happened in the Holocaust about walking into the showers and ending up in guest chambers. My point here is this, that to somebody of my background and generation, it's a no-brainer. Any person who grew with the, I often think of it as that I've always smelled the, the smoke of the guest chambers. Uh, it, it, it was so obvious, yet it was not obvious to non-Jewish therapists, to people who are not familiar with that part of our history. And this is, this is the way life is and it's acceptable. What I remember though, uh, making me very angry, was looking at the files of families who have been through the Holocaust. And when their history was taken, it usually started, arrived in Australia in 1948, 51, and what happened to them before they arrived was never uh, explored. Um, and I think probably one of the biggest motivators on me to uh, present about my work with survivors was the anger of ignoring uh, or not acknowledging or not exploring the Holocaust. Now, in the case by other therapists, by other, therapists, by yeah. other mental health professionals, because when, in the case of the shower phobia, maybe it's, it's the connection is a bit obscure, but when a man comes to see you and he suffers from depression and not to explore the fact that he has witnessed the murder of his children in the Holocaust or the murder of other, or his parents or other members of the family, it, it defies, for me it was, there was something about it that was outrageous. Um, How did you deal with that? Um, well, it was a, a, a gradual dawning on me that that was happening. And as I prepared for uh, my presentation at the first conference, it hit me more and more how much, how common it is, how prevalent it is. So, um, and when I presented, how I dealt with it is going public on it. I, uh, I, uh, I dealt with my anger in my own way, so I don't didn't uh, express the anger. But what I did write about was this: that I said that I wrote about a series of cases. I hate the word cases. A series of families in which. Uh, the presenting problems that people came to therapists with could not be properly understood and be helped or resolved because the Holocaust was not uh, acknowledged. And when the Holocaust uh, was brought into the thinking, uh, the issues that people came to the therapist with and eventually came to me could be understood and therefore the family to varying degrees could be helped. Um, and um, so th that was my first presentation. It was really about families I worked with where prior to them coming to see me, they sought help elsewhere and they were not helped because, from my point of view, the Holocaust was not brought into the conversation and into the thinking. What then happened was that after publishing in Generation, I reworked this article 
and published a similar one in the Australian New Zealand Journal of Family Therapy titled Silence, Working with Survivors and Their Families. And again, I think it may have been the first publication of its kind, certainly in family therapy in Australia, but it may be in the mental health field. Um, and it, it generated a lot of interest, and one way or another, it got republished, uh, as is, or asking me to change and modify. Um, and I also started doing workshop presentation about that work. It may ease the progress of this evening if you just mention perhaps on re reviewing that and hearing it a particular point that you'd like us to take away from that before we open up the two question two points of clarification. Maybe two or three very short. Uh, one I notice when I watch or listen to myself that I get, um, I'm hesitant, I'm anxious, and I feel the same here. And I want to share this with the audience, that as I came here today, you know, I thought, what a chutzpah, what a bloody cheek, you know what I mean? I, I, to think that I really understand the Holocaust, I don't. To th and uh, the, the, the struggle to, uh, be respectful of the people who I've worked with and their experience has been a very uh, difficult struggle for me. And I think it's very important because a lot of what has been written and said about the Holocaust, from my point of view, has been very trivial. And I I'm anxious that I don't join that, uh, that way of, uh, of thinking and talking. I'll make one, one other, other point. It's not just in the case of the shower phobia. To be clear, it wasn't just the mental health professionals who couldn't see the connection between the girl and what was happening at home and in society at large. The parents themselves didn't see it. Clearly, they were talking about the showers and the guest chambers without having any regard or any awareness of the girl and what was happening to her. Think about it again. If you talk about the Holocaust, you talk about going into the showers and not coming out, and you have a, I think she was eight or nine year old girl, and uh, she's refusing to go into the shower and refusing to use the soap, you should have been able, you should have, again, I'm getting anxious, it's, they couldn't because of their own difficulties, but we didn't. Uh, it was their difficulty or inability or failure to recognize what was happening to her that of course contributed. And therefore you could also say that once that connection was made and the conversation can be appropriate, in a sense that was already the, we were on the road Recovery, I don't believe in recovery, but it to some alleviation, to some understanding uh, and some improvement in what was happening. So just two points, or if there are two points to clarify that Moshe might be able to respond to. If not, that's all right, we can move. On. Yes, one and two, thank you. Yeah, the idea of post-traumatic stress disorder um, for survivors, that they didn't really deal with it until perhaps, my understanding, they didn't deal with it until 1961 with the Ockman trial, so it was repressed, but it was acknowledged with soldiers. So how do you deal with the post-traumatic stress, which is when it's been submerged for so long, and how do you deal with the <coughs> post-traumatic stress disorder? Can I just clarify that, in fact, post-traumatic stress disorder as a label was introduced in 1980, not 1961, with the Eichmann trial. So the me mental health profession did not acknowledge, which underlines Moshe's claim, that the very construct till 1980, after the Vietnam War, it wasn't acknowledged. So just to clarify that. And to add to this clarification, a further qualification, um, the, the, the diagnostic category of post-traumatic stress disorder 
was not introduced into mental health to the diagnostic uh, uh, manual by psychiatry or psychology. It was in, by protestation and demonstration by Vietnam War veterans. Further, and that maybe I'll deal with it now. Uh, you see, to me, in a sense, mental health professionals were given a conceptual tool for uh, working with survivors. But if you need, that's the good news. The bad news is that if you're a psychiatrist or psychologist, that you need this diagnostic category in order to understand that if a man who is in front of you is depressed because probably he lost the whole of his family and you need the diagnostic categories for it, the, you get my point. <laughs> Last question. Just a point, yes. Moshe, I'm interested in the impact or the um, realization of the parents when you highlighted the connection for them of the child. Thank you for the compliment. If you think that I remember, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, happy, I'm happy to make something up. You know, I'm very good at, uh, at doing it, but I don't remember. Well, on that, and sometimes memory works in an unusual way, so it may be something that Moshe will remember later by association. Uh, it's just the nature of this experience we sometimes cut off from certain memories, not because of lapse of memory, the present moment is too overwhelming. So anyway, now you mentioned, Moshe, in this first clip how you dealt partly with your upset, your rage, your anger, privately, and also through publications, books, and so on. And you mentioned a very ex interesting, to me, uh, in publishing phenomena, that the title of your book in English had to be changed for the title of your book in Israel. And we have now the second clip May on resilience or the long shadow. Because you touched about the anger, may I say something about that? Because I didn't answer at the time Pauline's question fully, and I wanted to say it. The question was, how did you deal with your anger? And I think, number one, I followed Whitlam's advice and maintained my rage. Uh, and I'm still, to some degree, still maintaining it. But having said so, what did I do with that rage? I did a number of things. Number one, I was trying to understand my own reluctance at time to acknowledge the Holocaust and, and that of my <coughs> colleagues and society at large. Um, and uh, then I did what uh, Susan Sontag, I think, recommended to all of us. She said once, Writing is the best form of revenge. So I tried to write. Well, let's turn perhaps to the second clip. <laughs> Between resilience and the long shadow, Australia and Israel. Publishers, part of the contract is they control what appears on the cover, front and back. So, and I realized that I've lost here. And so we started renegotiating and we then agreed that the title should be Resilience. What's interesting, about a year later, I was negotiating in Israel the publication of the book in Hebrew with a very good publisher called Zmora Bitan, maybe the best Israeli publishers. And the publisher said to me, I'm happy to publish the book, I want to publish the book, on one condition. The condition is that we title the book in Hebrew, The Long Shadow. And um, uh, of course it brought a smile to my face, <laughs> but uh, in a way it's a very good story to tell because it captures the tension for me and perhaps for all of us between the two sides of the Holocaust. Between, on one hand, that it's the long shadow, it's the tragedy, it's, uh, it's the Shoah, it's the, in Yiddish it's called Chorban, which is destruction. 
And on the other hand, in Israel, when the Shoah is commemorated, it's commemorated as Yom HaShoah VeHagvura. It's the day of Holocaust and heroism. And resilience is the other side of the story, I think. So, um, uh, and I also, uh, it was wonderful for me because it proves that good things happen to those who wait. So I waited and eventually the Israeli publishers let me have my way on that one, totally unexpectedly. Here I have a comment. You are a severe moral. You cut a little bit too much yes. in the editing. Um, <laughs> um, because it has to, what happened was, I, I, I had a contract with, uh, with uh, Heine, Heinemann Press to publish a book. Uh, uh, the last quarter of the book is about my work with Holocaust survivors and their families. And uh, whilst we were working on, on, on the book, we worked on the assumption, and they gave me actually an external editor. So I worked, I wrote it with my late wife, Tess, and we have an editor. So whenever we fought, we went to the editor, and she decided what, how we should do it. But we assumed, both the editor and Tess and myself, that the name of the book would be The Long Shadow, which is the name of the article that I wrote in Generation 2. And what happened was, when we finished the book, we submitted it, somebody from Heinemann Press rang me and said she would like to come and talk to me. And she said, look, to tell you the truth, she said, I uh, didn't, I dreaded the prospect of reading the book because I thought it would be so depressing and, and, and so on. What she was kind not to say that she just read a recent paper that says that books with positive titles sell more than one with negative titles. <laughs> and I'm sure that was the real motivation. Anyhow, she, and that's the point of, I knew that they have the right to impose on me a title. I would have chosen The Long Shadow, and the, in negotiation with them, we agreed on resilience. Then a year later, when I'm in Israel negotiating the publication of the book in Israel, the Israeli publisher says to me, uh, I'll publish the book on one condition that we call the book uh, The Long Shadow. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't go into surgery, and that's why I went into psychiatry, by the way. <laughs> but that provides... Sorry, my job. <laughs> <laughs> that is the basis of one tension, and if there are a couple of points to clarify, or we can move into the next other tension, which is the question, not now cultural tension, but tension between speaking and silence. So if there are a couple of points, if not, then we'll move on into, yes. My name's Miriam, pleased to meet you, and I'm enraptured in what you're saying. Um, in terms of understanding and acknowledgement of past trauma, I, I believe that the mental health system, the police, the government have not yet acknowledged that. And I, I, I get that impression when I see the treatment of Sudanese, Sudanese young people. Uh, there's violence, there's house break-ins, there's criminal offences, and all the community sees is people being violent. They haven't taken into context where the Sudanese have come from, what they've experienced, the refugee camps and the violence. So I'm, my question is, it's a bit, it's a bit uh, out of context with the Holocaust, but do you think the mental health system is acknowledging past experiences and context of migrants? <laughs> Shall I answer? Well, well, I'm just wondering if, because that has a number of uh, issues that we'll raise in the following four clips as well, so there may be a response coming and if at the end we can return to that question. So if we can have it on hold, all right? So can we move just one more? Just a clarification, if you keep, keep it brief, please. No, I just wanted to respond to the, um, the tension that, Moshe, you said between the title resilience 
and the long shadow. And um, because, of course, no doubt the majority of people here, resilience is not a foreign concept not to the direct survivors and to second generation. And the difficulty I have with the word resilience is that, particularly as a second generation person, it's not about resilience. It's about, as of course you've worked all your life, it's about finding one's identity under the long shadow. So I celebrate the fact that your title ultimately surfaced, surfaced because the word resilience, to me, is not what this is about. It's about finding one's identity and being resilient with that. Shall I answer it, if you wish to? Uh, ju just, uh, I have a problem. I don't hear very well what uh, the, the sound, but if I understand correctly, when ap applied to uh, second generation, the concept of resilience is a problematic one in a number of ways. Clearly, their parents have been tremendously resilient, but they've also suffered greatly. And very often you have a father, and I've seen many, where very successful father, but you also hear him every night uh, yelling in his screams, uh, in his uh, sleep. And what also happens is that you may be very resilient, you in the general sense. However, at the same time, when many children of survivors look at their parents and no matter how much they achieve, they feel it's nothing compared to what their parents achieve because of their suffering. And to some, the concept of resilience gets them down rather than uh, 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 helps them, as it were. And, and this is the problem of, of our language that, look, at a different level uh, to the Nazis, we were all the same, we were just numbers. But in reality, we react differently, and very often, and more importantly, in an ambivalent way. So for example, the resilience of the parents, the survivors themselves, was both a problem and an inspiration to their children. That, if I have to generalize, that would be my generalization, I think. Now, we move from the way that we use language, as you've highlighted the, the, the profound issues for one word even. Now let's move to the next level, which is where there's no words, and what Moshe has to say about silence, like talking, is interactive. I want to start by being very personal. I have felt privileged to work with the survivors and their families. I hope that I don't sound corny. I feel it very deeply. At the end of the day, when people trust you enough, and you know, part of being through the Holocaust, you trust, your capacity to trust gets severely damaged if not destroyed. And when somebody decides to trust me and share with me their experiences, it, it is a great privilege. And they have also been my best teachers. Um, and what they have taught me is a number of important things. One, understanding and appreciating the nature of human resilience. That um, look. These people, and I, in a way I, I have a problem always to talk in groups, but we have no choice. Holocaust survivors came here after they've been through hell and back. We often forget the Holocaust started in 33 and finished in 45. 
It wasn't a single event. It was event after event. They, were, they suffer starvation, death. I don't need to tell that part. But, and they arrive, say in Australia, without language, without education in the majority of cases, without money. And one way or another, there's most have gone dancing and singing and raised children who can complain about them, but still have done by and large very well. That is a very, very, very important human story about human capacity, human resilience, and the support that many have given each other and the community that they have built. And, and that's the important thing, I think. Now, you may have gathered there's a slight glitch there, uh, but this was not about the paradox. So we will come back. This was actually the last segment. But fortuitously, it's working out well because this is a summary of how survivors arrived and the virtual other world that they left and arrived to and the human resilience, if we use that term, for the survivor generation. Now, we'll come back to the second generation and included in Moshe's lessons learnt is the conversation that is both talked and silent. So we'll go now, hopefully, to the next one. And I think I've worked much more with the children of survivors than when survivors. And they, the children, often involve their parents and ask them or demanded of them or pressurized them to come and see me. But what is the experience of a, a second generation uh, person of, what's the experience of their family life or, and of the Holocaust? One, that your parents have been through untold pain and trauma to varying degrees very often commonly you feel that it's part of your job to make it better for them to help them to heal them to repair them and by and large, the tragedy is that you can't. What can you do? There is also a huge expectation that you will do good. How do you do good? You know the, the joke about uh, when you ask a Jewish mother, uh, how old are your children? She says, The lawyer is two, and the doctor is five. But when the Holocaust survivor, just to be an ordinary doctor or an ordinary lawyer is not good enough, either to her or to the children themselves. The, 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 the way they experienced their parents' expectation of them was that they needed to succeed. They needed to do exceptionally well and at the same time to heal the wound. Now the way I read it, the way I understand it is this. By and large, you were not able to heal the wounds. You own or your parents. So what do you do then? You compensate for that by succeeding more. So you're professionally more successful, uh, you write more books, uh, you make more money, or whatever it is. And that, by the way, is a similar experience for the parents. They were not able to be as good a parent as they would have liked to. They couldn't have been as communicative, they could not offer as good an intimacy, to be as nurturing, as loving, 
as tender as they would have liked to. So how do you deal with it then? You make up for it by giving more in practical ways, material ways, as it were. And that applies to both parents and children to varying degrees. So we've moved on to the relationship between the survivor and the second generation. And Moshe, any points to bring out from those two before we move to the last one? I'm still on the one before, so shall I comment on it now or later? Late, later, perhaps. Later, so okay. We'll see it. So I'll leave it. Leave it. Two, two points. Yes, one. You're talking now about second generation. I'm what we call the child survivor. And in, in one way, we realized that we were a second generation. But in, in another way, we were really completely unacknowledged until Paul Vallant brought this group together in Melbourne. I'm sure you know all about that. So I'm wondering, does this... I know an awful about it. I know a little bit about it. <laughs> so I'm wondering, do you have any particular you know, comments yes. in, in your... Yes, uh, definitely. Look, what I know is... Sorry. Uh, what I know is this, that a lot of child survivors is both their second generation because the majority had their parents going through the Holocaust and they experienced all the difficulties that were typical of the second generation as well as their own uh, lot, whatever. But having said so, look, at the same time, we are talking in groups. There are survivors, child survivors, and second generation, and I regard myself as a third generation. But at the end of the day, each one of us had unique experiences. And it's dangerous from my point of view. Uh, look, primarily I'm not a writer about the Holocaust. I've written it. But basically I'm a clinician, and I know that every day when I see somebody, their story is very, very different to anyone else. I have never heard two stories that are the same. Yes. Hi, Moshe. Just a question about, I know that everyone's individual, but whether there are trends in between second generation and the way they parent the third generation and issues that might, you might be seeing frequently in your therapy room. Look, the most commonly quoted one is num num two things. One is probably they are overprotective. It's most, and the second one is they try to learn from what they believe are the mistakes of their parents and do the opposite. And when you do the opposite, you get to the different type of troubles, as it were. <laughs> but it's inevitable that you do that, as it were. I'm not... Uh, I'm, I'm light-hearted about it, but there is a serious answer to this. The answer is that if you're a second generation and uh, you believe, you experience, that your parents made mistakes, it becomes one of the most powerfully motivating force in your own uh, practice as a parent. Uh, in fact, I think probably... the <coughs> To my way of thinking, one of the most powerful human motivators, which has been understated in the literature in general, and I think in relation to second generation, is the motivation to, or you use your parents, they become a negative model to you. That they, what you have seen that you think was wrong, you try to correct. And it's a human tendency when you try to correct you often overcorrect. That's the general answer. Now, perhaps it's no coincidence that we have divine providence intervening. And the last segment, which was scheduled earlier, actually, I remember one of the teachings I learned from you, Moshe, this is in the 90s, was at a workshop, you said something like, what's the difference between a paradox and a problem? 
And I remember that to this day, a paradox has no solution. At least this is my recollection. Can I correct you? Please do. Uh, I think I said probably, or I should have said if I didn't, yes. the difference between a problem and a predicament. Predicament? The predicament has uh -huh. no solution. The, the uh -huh. human condition is a, a predicament, predicament, and we cannot overcome our... Beautiful. So where does paradox fit in with the peas? <laughs> ah. It's, it's interesting. I think uh, the first person to write about paradox was actually a, a Holocaust survivor, Viktor Frankl. Uh, and uh, now I'm going to be a bit technical and I try to uh, use ordinary language. Viktor Frankl, uh, who was a Holocaust survivor, developed a technique that he referred to as paradoxical intention, in which he basically described for example, when a patient walked into his room and the patient said, I'm scared out of my mind that I'll have a, an anxiety attack, Victor Frankl would say to him, could you please have an anxiety attack in front of me now? And uh, very few have managed to do it in front of him. <laughs> uh, now, uh, in family therapy, uh, the use of the paradox and thinking paradoxically is a very common feature of family therapy thinking. To my way of thinking, the real paradox, the one that interests me the most, is the paradox that is part of life itself. And life is full of paradoxes. Uh, and one of them is, I think, the one that probably you're trying to get me to talk about. When somebody comes to see you and they have difficulties in talking to you, and you expect and demand of them to talk, and you feel that your success and failure as a therapist is the evidence of how much they talk, they won't talk to you. If, on the other hand, you do what I hope I'm able to do today, to say, don't feel you need to talk to me, but if you are able to, can we talk about what makes it difficult for you or why you are reluctant to talk? And the paradox is the more you accept people's reluctance to talk, the more willing they are to talk. And that's, I think, what the... Yes, thank you. And with that, we'll go into the conversation about silence. And this is the last segment, so it will open up for discussion. Now, um, in... Um, writing about the Holocaust, one of the main things that I wrote about in the first, first article was titled Silence. And I want to explore the silence. And in a way, it will be connected to the things I talked at the personal level last time we spoke. Universally, it has been claimed that survivors refuse to talk, unwilling to talk about what happened to them. That, and I, um, and very often negative terminologies, terminology was attached to that reluctance or unwillingness or difficulties of talking. Me as a family therapist, and because of my also personal background, I was particularly keen to explore and then write about the interactive aspects of the silence, by which I once wrote, and I like that sentence very much, that silence like talking, is interactive. When people are silent, it rarely is just about them. It's about the others, their therapist, their own family, society at large, and so on and so forth. Uh, when we talk like that, we say talk or no talk. The reality of life, nobody talks about everything and nobody is silent about everything. One of the most common things that happens to me 
regularly, somebody would come, a second generation, and say, my parents never talked to me about the Holocaust. So me being tricky, I said, so how do you know that they've been through the Holocaust? And immediately he says, and as I draw them out, they realize that a lot has been said. But the reality uh, is that in relation to Holocaust survivors and other people too, you talk about some things and you don't talk about others. But also the other thing which is terribly important to say is this. The more silence there is, the more powerful the communication. The Holocaust is much more powerful, is communicated more powerfully in silence than in the talking. Now it is this power of communication between words and literally between words are the silences that perhaps is the paradox that we're going to be left with. Now, could I just get an indication from Pauline? It is now nearly quarter two. Can we go till eight o'clock? Yes? So we've got 15 minutes uh, to now engage further in conversation. And there were questions that we left hanging in the air. And first, perhaps three questions one, two at the back, and one here. So we've got three plus, I'll return to the Sudanese uh, refugee question, but one right at the back and three uh, questions for... Hello. Sorry. I'm just wondering... Oh. oh. Okay. Yeah? Yep. I'm just wondering when you were talking before about the children and the parents, the parents want to be... The children want to be more successful and the parents want to give them more and that's what they strive for. What happens when, like, the parents can't give and the, and the child doesn't, doesn't succeed to the parents' expectations? What happens there? They're troubled. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not being uh, frivolous, but uh, life is full of disappointed and people disappointments that parents and children often uh, disappoint each other. Right. So Moshe, I want to ask, uh, you've spoken about uh, behavioral patterns between well, parents of survivors and then second generation parents, how they might parent their, uh, the third generation. What I'm wanting to ask about is what your perception or perspective is about epigenetics and how, how um, uh, trauma or perhaps unresolved trauma is passed genetically from generation to generation and perhaps even third generation like me are actually experiencing aspects of the trauma that survivors yeah. might have, that, you know, that they have carried. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. Shall I answer now? Or? Yes, yeah. please. Um, look. I know that the recent evidence is that there is some transmission of trauma genetically. That's what you are referring to. But as a clinician, whether the difficulties that, say, somebody who is a third generation, or he has certain difficulties, whether it has been genetically uh, transmitted or through the environment because uh, your parents have been second generation or whatever, probably doesn't make that much difference. You are dealing with what's in front of you with the best tools that are available to you today. I'm sure there'll be lots of other people who disagree with what I've just said now, but that's the way I look at it. And maybe I'll say one other thing. When there is a new... Uh, research model or the different theory emerges, I get worried because what happens is this, that the history of psychiatry, psychology and psychotherapy is that we have had some wonderful theories and I think very often mental health professionals to varying degrees use their own, the models that they work with as a way of avoiding dealing with what was in front of them. 
Um, that involves, just to be clear, family therapy, psychoanalysis, to give just two examples. In psychoanalysis, there's a, a lot of documented evidence. When the psychoanalyst uh, was a survivor himself, and the patient was a survivor themselves, they would go through years of analysis without talking about the Holocaust. And again, think about it. The patient is depressed. He comes to the psychoanalyst, and they don't talk about what happened to him and his family during the Holocaust. And what gives them the, the cover is the, the psychoanalytic model. Take another one. It's one of my family therapy heroes. People who know about family therapy know that a man that I admire greatly, uh, Salvador Mnuchin. Salvador Mnuchin is one of the most important and influential family therapists. What very few people know is that he arrived in Israel during the War of Independence, then went to America, studied psychiatry, and came back, and he was the psychiatrist in charge of Youth Aliyah. Youth Aliyah dealt with the, children, the survivors who came to Israel, often, they were the orphans of the Holocaust. Mnuchin, as far as I could see, never wrote a word about it. Further, what does he then do? He develops a family therapy theory. What's the theory? The theory, I'll use a fancy word, is contemporaneous, meaning the past is irrelevant. You don't look at the past. Two, you do not explore feelings and emotions, and you don't explore the inner life of the people involved. A beautiful theory for ignoring what happened to Holocaust survivors and their families. So beware of theories and beware of new research. This is not a, I'm not against theory, I'm not against research, but I'm also am aware of how new research and theories can be utilized to ignore the people you are working with and their own pain and suffering. Thank you. If I could just take prerogative <laughs> to underline the points that Moshe made within my own profession of child psychiatry and psychoanalysis. As we mentioned, the Jewish Film Festival around the corner, there is a film, I think not in the festival, but certainly at the classic, called Three Identical Strangers. Now, that involves one of the um, doyens of my specialty, Professor Peter Neuberger, who was a refugee from Nazi Germany and took up a post in 1941 at Columbia in New York. And this film concerns a design of an experiment that he was central in that involved mother, triplets and twins, multiple births, separations. Now, at the same time, this goes a step further than just beware of theories. Beware of people who split their theories because this professor was actually the co-editor of the most influential text that a, a yearly journal that I studied in my training called the Psychoanalytic Study of the Child. So on the one hand, collaborating with Anna Freud and the Yale professor, uh, Albert Solnit, promoting the awareness of that sacred bond between babies and their mother. At the same time, this experiment that was designed under his auspices was going on keeping the knowledge of that separation secret from adoptive parents and indeed the twins and triplets who were involved. So it's a very fraught subject and I also think we all have human frailties, as you say, Moshe, that we try our best and sometimes alongside the best is sometimes the inexplicable is unfolding. Yes. Back. Yes, and then one here. Yes. 
thank you to both of you, Moshe and George. It's been really an amazing discussion. Just wanted to come back to the theme about the silence, how, how painful that can be. As powerful as it is, it's also very painful for the second generation to live in a home with just so much silence. So I just mentioned that, but um, at least tonight you've put some lid on a way of looking at it. But I do remember as well, um, as we're coming up to the passing of our parents, going to uh, the Hevra Kaddisha and um, being at, a, at um, the, the um, funeral services of the Holocaust survivors and the children getting up to speak and saying, I just never heard anything about my father or my mother. And I'm here today to bury my parents, a parent, and I'm, I'm no wiser. And I just, being a, a member of the audience, just felt that pain and how, how sad that, that is. And obviously it's just part of what happened in the Holocaust. Uh, if I can comment. Um it's not just said, it's, it's worse than said in the following way. One of the issues for second generation has been this, that very often the pain and the suffering that the parents had, in a way they had the context for understanding their own pain and suffering. They knew what happened to them. Their children experience the anxiety, the terror, the depression, the violence at time, the anger, without having the context for understanding it. And that is one of the key issues for second generation, I think. Thank you. Last question here, and then we'll respond to the lady who mentioned the Sudanese issue. But yes. Um, <clears throat> This is actually not, not a question, so you're off the hook, um, but it's just a small offering. Um, you've, we've, you've talked a lot about silence and, and also briefly before about, uh, about the anger um, that you'd felt. Um, and so just in, a, in an offering to try and rehabilitate resilience as the English title of your book, um, which I was looking at before, and what struck me is that um, uh, if you mix up the letters, you get two different words from resilience, and one is silence, and the other is ire. <laughs> so maybe your publisher was, you know, working on a level <laughs> beyond I, us I, all. I might use your editor next. <laughs> <laughs> this gets into gematria and a whole other level of. <laughs> What's no. the number? Yeah. <laughs> Now, just by way of responding to the earlier question, and I'm mindful of our eight o'clock frame, uh, the non-Holocaust trauma, second generation, community, cultural impact, and by way of answering, one of the anecdotes that you mentioned to me over the lemongrass ginger tea, Moshe, was your experience at <laughs> hospital here in Melbourne. I told you not to say. <laughs> Now, you said that I had a grin like a Cheshire cat when you mentioned that, <laughs> as if I've just tasted the cream. And so I just couldn't resist, and I offer you the chance not to respond, but... No, no. <laughs> no but I will tell it, because I think it's a very important... Yes, and that relates, very I think, important. to the attitude towards the community, towards all traumas, but this is a particular example of it. I presented my work in a hospital in Melbourne. Uh, and uh, I said the sort of thing that I've said here tonight. And if you know the way hospitals work, the first question is always asked by the most important person in the room, which is always the professor of, in this case, professor of psychiatry. And what he, he asked me the following question. I think I'm trying to quote verbatim. He said to me, tell me, why are the Jews so preoccupied with the Holocaust? Why can't they not be like the German, who immediately after the war became positive, 
and, um, and uh, look forward and rebuild their country. And I was, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, but I, I, I recovered reasonably quickly because I was seriously shocked. And I said to him that uh, a few days ago, a woman came to see me and she told me uh, that she was devastated by having been raped uh, 20 or 30 years ago. And I told him I'm convinced that the man who raped her is not as damaged, he's much more positive and looking forward <laughs> than she is. But, but why I think it is worthwhile mentioning it, that's why I've, I'm happy to go public on it, Happy is not the right word, um, is this. That, that's right. Some of my friends who were in the, in the audience then came to me and comforted me by saying, you know, the professor in question uh, has worked with many Holocaust survivors over the years. And that was the, the time that I, I got really worried because... At the end of the day, the quality of assistance, support, and help that you can offer any person who has been through any trauma, any suffering, is not proportionate to the amount of reading you have done, the number of degrees that you have, uh, the number of books that you have published. It is about a fundamental attitude that you convey to the person you're working with. And I think it is often uh, misunderstood that that is the fundamental issue. And from a therapist's point of view, it's a very difficult balance that you struggle to achieve between, on one hand, wanting to give people some hope, and on the other hand, <laughs> not wanting to cultivate false hopes, uh, Etc. 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 Between not pretending to know what you don't know, but not pretending to, to be that you are totally ignorant. If at the end of the day, it is about the quality of relationship and the quality of attitude that uh, you provide the people you work with. Now, think again: if you are a Holocaust survivor and you come to a therapist who directly or indirectly communicates to you that the people he admires are the people who have murdered you, your family, and that uh, it really, it, um, it, it, I don't know what words to use, so I'll stop. I think this is the moment of silence, that one is lost, literally lost for articulation. And that's, I think, you, Moshe, have embodied the experiences that you have accumulated over the lifetime that you have been in clinical and beyond clinical experiences. And on a lighter moment, <coughs> when my introduction from Brian Stackhole was that you'll be interested to hear what you have to say, that's minor compared to the interest that you've had us spellbound in hearing your words actually evolve to meet each moment and transcend cliches, the books that you've written, the articles, your presence, I think, is your gift and your wisdom is the icing on the cake. Can I have one more sentence? <laughs> Always a lot. Look, to be honest, I'm always ambivalent when we talk about a subject of like this, about uh, the, this. I think it's, I feel personally it's inappropriate. So, but thank you. Um, uh, I, I just want to say one more thing. In the interviews with uh, Pauline, I mentioned the work of one Israeli historian by the name of Hannah Yablonka. And I want to mention it because what she, what she, writes about is this. 
she's claiming that of all the migrations that arrived anywhere in the world, there has not been a group of migrants who has contributed to the host country as much as the Holocaust survivors have contributed to Israeli society. And I, but, Could you please let me finish, you <laughs> You spoil my... Uh, uh, no, she, she does the research. She's a researcher, and she did the research of Israel. And my point is this, that I believe that it's all similarly true of Australia. And what I wish is that somebody would actually take the task of actually studying it. I think it will be relatively easy to document the, the, the amount, the contribution that survivors in Australia have made to the society at large, including their children. So no matter what their suffering has been, maybe they didn't sleep at night and they had nightmares, and maybe they've been overprotective of their children, but at the same time, they've made a inordinate contribution to Australian society. And, uh, and this is another context which everyone who works with survivors of their families need to be aware of. And this is the context that this, this particular professor was not aware of. Thank you, Moshe, for what has been an extraordinarily engaging evening. I think judging by the, the, the feeling here. Thank you, George, for your expert guidance here in illuminating this very amazing and interesting aspect of your work, Moshe, but also the giving glimpses of you and third generation, which shows there's a lot more in, in the testimony, in the interview that we did. So if you're interested in seeing the entire sequence of Mosh Lang's interviews, please fill in your details. There's a table outside and there's forms you can fill in. And I just want to extend a thank you to people here at the centre who made, who made this uh, event pop happen. Michael Cohen to Danielle Camion and of course to Robbie Simon. And please join us. Some tea and coffee available at the back if you want. Thank you very much.